and then after he's finished with that, we'll have Matt present his senior thesis, uh, the research that he's conducted throughout the course of the academic year so far. Um, and once he's concluded, then we'll have two rounds of defense questioning with the faculty panel. Um, and then after that's finished, we will finally open it up to audience questions for any questions that you all might have. So without further ado, Mr. Garvey. So I have had the pleasure of knowing Matt uh, since last year uh, when he started with us. I was able to teach him chemistry. Uh, I found him to be a remarkable student. He was both intelligent and inquisitive, although I do have to say uh, you're still at cornhole. Uh, left a little bit to be desired. It was, a, it was a review. Um, what is interesting, and many of you may not know, is that this is likely not the first time I actually met Matthew. Uh, his parents and I used to go to church years ago, and while I don't remember this, it is very likely that I met him as an infant, maybe even held And here you are, uh, nearly a legal adult, nearly graduated. And so Matthew, please, uh, Instruct us on truth. Uh, well, before, before I begin, I want to start off by thanking my amazing panel and Mr. Midmeyer and all the other teachers and friends that have helped me. I couldn't have done it without you. So, man frequently challenges cultural beliefs in search of answers to life's biggest questions, questions that still require an answer. Philosophy aims at the truth to provide people with the answers behind the ideas that culture previously put down such as how to live the truth and how to live the good life. Aristotle puts forth the concept of the good life as a life of happiness in which a person exhibits total virtue and mastery over the three transcendental ideas of truth, goodness, and beauty. This idea can be compared to a three-legged chair. If you take one out, then the good life will not be supported. See, truth is most essential because truth has a higher good. Truth is eternal and truth is everlasting. Aristotle argued that achieving happiness through virtue is the key to unlocking the good life. But happiness is only temporary. The Aristotelian good life and happiness is only somewhat obtainable in life, a late life. But there's something bigger than happiness, and that is joy. Joy can be considered eternal happiness, meaning it will never fully be lost, and it can be found through the divine. To have joy means to have a peaceful contentment in any circumstance. One should still aim and strive toward happiness because it is necessary and proper and for living virtue, but the gain of joy is more fulfilled. Joy is more important than happiness because it paves the way to reach a good life through truth. Therefore, truth is the most essential of transcendental idea for one to live and lead the good life because truth leads to joy. See, the ultimate purpose of life is to live the divinely ordained good life, which is a life in which one has accepted the truth the possibility of eternal life and lives according to how God instructs me to live. First John chapter 6 says that one finds joy when in a relationship with the divine. See, particular truths, such as those pertaining to the arts and sciences and other, and other disciplines, provide a lesser contentment in the form of poor taste and hints of complete joy. The fullness or completeness of joy arises through, through one's acceptance of the truth that through the divine, eternality is possible, as shown through the Biblical salvific message of the gospel. If the purpose of life is to achieve happiness, then most people will fail. But what cannot be fully lost is joy. In Psalms uh, chapter 30, verse 5, David, during all his trials and tribulations, wrote that weeping may spend the night, but there's joy in the morning. Joy comes from the divine and man's knowledge of, of eternality of the soul. See, it is important to know that truth is, is objective, and there's no such thing as subjective truth. Instead, subjective truth should be known as belief. The belief is not always true. Belief or subjective truth is what one says something to be, but objective truth is the way that something is. St. Thomas Aquinas, in question two of the Summa Theologica, argues that the same truth is objective, is, auto, is subjective, is automatically an objective statement, thus contradicting itself. See, the truth is always reliable and in accord with undoubted fact. The truth never changes, and because of because it is the pure essence of a thing or an idea, and the truth defines the very essence of goodness and beauty, thus showing what is good and beautiful. See, philosophers have put forth many different theories and ways to define truth. The only true and accurate way to define it is through the correspondence theory. Correspondence theory argues that truth corresponds to reality, and that true statements must be objective. The correspondence theory is the most agreed upon definition of truth. And Aquinas and the Summa Theologica argue that a judgment is said to be true when it conforms to reality. 
And Aristotle, in his metaphysics, also argues that if a statement or judgment is connected with the facts of reality, then it is indeed true. The correspondence theory is not subjective, and it provides the best universal way to define truth. Therefore, through using the correspondence theory, the definition of truth is the essence of something in accordance with reality. Philosophers have pursued the truth in a moral virtue. Virtue, according to the Plato's Republic, is the well-being of a soul. In the ethics, Aristotle examines the moral virtue of truthfulness and how it sits in a golden mean. He says that a truthful person is characterized by the qualities of truth, meaning if one displays too much truthfulness, then boastfulness will shine through. But if one shows minimal truthfulness, then at least the vigil lying and the truth becomes diminished. The moral virtue of truthfulness is dependent on truth, just like all the other virtues rely on truth for the essence as its foundation. Truth and virtue work in concert to lead one to a life of joy. The truth is in a state of consistency, and it is relied upon every day, oftentimes not even realized. The truth never changes. Knowing the truth is essential in both science and math. Physicians, doctors, and pharmaceutical chemists must know the facts and truths of the human anatomy and the effects that certain medications can have on prescribed. The misuse and lacking of knowledge or truth in prescriptions have led to thousands of deaths worldwide every year. The patient's touch of joy or peaceful contentment is resulted by knowing that the doctor knows the truth, and this, and this leads to hope that better days lie ahead. See, math and arithmetic also rely on the consistency of truth and knowledge of truth. Math is always true. For example, 1 plus 1 will always equal 2, and this will never change. But to take this concept another step, one can look at the truth and consistency of pi, also known as 3.14. Pi is always true and accurate in finding the ratio of the circumference of a circle. If one divides the circumference of a marble by its diameter, the answer will always equal pi. But to make this concept even bigger, if one divides the circumference of the star Betelgeuse, which is 1,000 times bigger than the sun, the, by its diameter, it will also equal pi. If, men, if any mathematical or scientific concept, such as pi or uh, pharmaceuticals, was not always true, then geometric laws and architectural science would be inaccurate. One can have a constitutive joy by having confidence in the reliability and sustainability of truth, because number is a incorporeal truth or essence, meaning it is eternal. The pursuit of truth is essential, and its foundation builds up both goodness and beauty in order to fulfill actions and ideas leading to the good life. To illustrate this, let's take music for example. Music is one of the four parts of quadruple. The foundation of music relies on the truths of musical key, just as the foundation of the good life relies on truth. Beethoven, who is one of the most admired composers of Western music, created one of the most famous musical compositions, Hallelujah, which, in the, which is in the key of C. One cannot play in the key of F or any other key while the rest of the ensemble is playing in the key of C. And the truths like this must be followed. If an ensemble follows the truth of key, then a good and beautiful sound will result. Beethoven's Hallelujah and other music can cause people to have an opening to joy and peace when uh, performed in accordance with key and truth. Without truth being a strong foundation, musical pieces and many other concepts will fall apart. This leads one to realize that truth is the foundation to the good one. Truth is most essential because without knowing the complete truth, one is hidden from the truth entirely. Deception is a misconception, misuse, and falling for perceived truth. Aristotle's ethics states that one who is guided by passion and not by reason will easily be deceived. Deception leads to a lack of joy because it alters the appearance of truth. Shakespeare's tragedy, King Lear, explores this theme of deception and blindness to the truth. Uh, this thematic element is shown with the character of Glasner. Glasner only follows what appears to be true in front of him. In reality, he is just embracing a falsehood and becomes deceived by his eldest son plotting against him. It is not until later in the play when he becomes physically blind. And this is a turning point because his literal blindness opens him up to the real truth, and he is no longer blinded by deception. Glasner says later in the play that he would rather not be able to see than be able to be blinded by deception again. Because of him now knowing the truth, his relationship with his son is restored and it leads him to have joy in his newfound circumstance, and he finds a new meaning to life. Uh, even though his discovery of the truth was painful, 
Joy was the result. This led to hope. The pursuit of truth is so essential, because without it, one can easily fall prey to the hidden falsehoods of society. It is the responsibility of man to walk in truth for the sake of joy to avoid deception. See, truth is the most valuable and fundamental idea to having honest, influential relationships. Building strong relationships can be metaphorically compared to a bridge. You have two foreign lands, and a bridge must be built between them, and the bridge must be strong or it will fail. Honest relationships are the exact same. Once the relationship bridge begins to be built, truths begin to be shared between the two peoples. At first, the bridge is not going to be very strong, and only certain truths can be shared, also known as likely the truths. As time goes on, and more and more truths get shared, the bridge begins to strengthen. And the stronger the bridge becomes, the more truths can be shared, the more heavy truth. This action of truth being shared leads to trust being built. However, once a lie tra travels across that bridge, the bridge begins to weaken and it leads to a loss of joy. Now that the bridge is weak, if a strong and heavy truth tries to get shared, the bridge will fall and the once strong relationship is all divided because of a lie. See, truths don't cost anything, but a lie can cost everything. When the truth is the centerpiece of an influential relationship, it leads to the subset of joy and an inseparable lie fastened by honesty. To fully live the good life through truth, one must speak the truth. Not speaking the truth can lead to harm and mistrust. Speaking the truth can make life better, commonly displayed throughout history. For example, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln confessed the truth about the morality of slavery. And in Gettysburg Address, Lincoln states that all men are created equal. Lincoln speaking this truth later led to all men becoming equal under the law, making life better for these individuals, and leading to a foretaste of joy and hope. Man should seek to tell the truth, even if it hurts, because not doing so causes trust to be lost, leading to destruction. Proverbs 8 7 states that for my mouth shall speak the truth, and wickedness be detestable to my lips. Speaking the truth is essential. When one chooses not to speak the truth, it leads to a path that is most difficult to turn around. Speaking the truth leads one to a life of integrity, and is important for leading the good life. There are many different common responses to the truth. People choose to deny, hide, fight, or accept the truth. To live the good life, one must respond to the truth in a certain way, and this is only by accepting the truth, even if it may cause pain or unknowingness at first, because the truth, by its definition, is the way that things are in reality. When accepting the truth, joy may not be prevalent at first. But one can look back later in life and see that knowing the truth was more beneficial than not. This contentment leads to joy. See, the truth often illuminates, but society does not like to shine through. Because accepting the truth can sometimes come to the cost that many view as uncomfortable. Elizabeth Elliot argued that instead of denying the truth, some people actually hate the truth. In her book, Full Baskets of Frogs, she writes that Plato, 300 years before Christ predicted that if ever truly good man were to appear, the man who would tell the truth, he would in the end be killed or crucified. That risk was once taken in its fullest measure. The man, Jesus, appeared. He told the world the truth, and he even made the claim, I am the truth. As Plato foresaw, the man was killed. See, people hated the truth so much so they tried, that they tried to kill the truth. But as we all know, they failed, because the truth always wins and the truth is a lie. People have a right to free will, and one is ignored if one is free to ignore the truth, but not free to ignore the consequences. Winston Churchill, the former prime minister during World War II, states that truth is the most valuable thing in the world. So valuable, it is often protected by a bodyguard of lies. Though it may be difficult at times, it is simply better to accept the truth rather than hide in plain sight from it. Accepting the truth leads one, leads one to live a life of truth. Therefore, leading one to live the good life. Living a life of truth requires a particular form of dedication and strong integrity because the truth is not always pleasant. People want to know the truth, even if it hurts. When one does not know the truth, one begins to fill in the gaps of suspicion, consequently leading to deception, blindness, and unprincipled reaction. When one lives in conformity with truth, one can see that truth is beautiful and truth is good. It can be easy to run from the truth. But the journey back is extremely difficult and humble. Living in truth restores joy and allows one to become accountable, reliable, dependable, and trustworthy. Because integrity and character rely on the principles of truth. 
The truth is most essential because it is the foundation of life. There are many different types of the good life. The two most important to strive for are the Aristotelian and the divinely ordained good life. One reaches the Aristotelian good life when one reaches the pure form of happiness achieved by attaining virtues and has mastery over the three transcendental ideas of truth, goodness, and beauty. And the divinely ordained good life is the life of which one has accepted and believes in the opportunity of receiving eternal life from God and lives it truthfully according to how God instructs me to live. One who is living the good life seeks to point others to the truth, which can result in joy. And joy leads to restoration of hope within oneself. It is man's responsibility to live a life of truth. In order to uphold one's integrity, maintain honest, influential relationships, and block deception from entering one's youth. The only way to multiply one's happiness and joy is to share it with others. Um, you know, stating that basically if any, uh, anybody um, 
basically a truly good man, whatever, here he'd be crucified. And uh, Jesus came, he was crucified. Um, he spoke a little bit about there being a, uh, a man not only denies the truth frequently, but also hates the truth. Um, why, in your opinion, do so many have such an aversion or an allergy to the truth? Where, where does this come from? Um, I mean, the, the hatred towards the truth comes from sin in the world. And it's, it's easy to hate the truth, but when one chooses to while well, while they're hating truth, it's, it's hard to turn back because hate, hatred is there. So if many people often hate the truth because they often don't like to accept the reality of it. And so it, it can be easier for people to just choose to hate it or ignore it and hide from it than just accept it. And so that's right, question. Yeah. Alright. <clears throat> Uh, you discussed how prioritizing truth leads to joy in disciplines such as mathematics, pharmaceuticals, and music. How would prioritizing truth lead to joy in other disciplines such as logic, art, I don't know, Latin, um, <laughs> economics, or government, anything like that? Um, truth, truth is integrity. And as I kind of talked about in my paper, is that uh, there's a kind of a big truth and a big joy, and from that joy, it branches down to every truth in the world. And that's where you can get particular, uh, that's where particular truths and particular joys come into play. So one can have, uh, see the truth in Latin, and see how Latin is ordered, and how they can, they can correlate the orderness of Latin to the order of the world, and be like, wow, this is amazing. And that provides joy to the truth of it, because truth leads to joy. All right, I'm going rogue here. I'm making new questions as we go. Okay. Um, my pastor gave a sermon at one point talking about the difference between truth and grace, and to always err on the side of grace. How would you respond to that if you're claiming that truth is most essential? Mm -hmm. That you, in some circumstances, would err on the side of grace? And can you think of an example why that might be? Yep. There's a situation, you see something happening, you want to stand up for the truth. Mm -hmm. But maybe because of the relationships involved or the situation involved, you err on the side of grace. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. So grace and truth kind of go hand in hand. So where if you give someone grace, you have to eventually give them the truth. I didn't from them forever because that just leads to that deception. So I mean, I would I would say that if you're offering grace to someone during a certain circumstance, after that is over, you should tell them the truth and just kind of kind of really tell them how things are going. Does that impact the level of joy in the situation then? Um, maybe, probably, sometimes not at first, but within that person who the truth was told to. They can look back later in life and go, you know what? Knowing that truth, you know, heard it first, was more beneficial than not. And that can tend to be secure. So I will add that concludes the panel questions. And so now we will uh, open it up to audience questions. <coughs> if you preference, to mom and dad, do you have any questions you would like to ask? First off, Matthew, you did a very good job. I'm proud of you. And I was really surprised that something came out of your mouth. <laughs> and amazing. I just wouldn't expect that from you. But um, with doing your thesis and presentation, you had the option of doing one of the three things. Doing it on beauty, goodness, or truth. Why did you choose truth? Um, I chose truth because through studies in philosophy, I have learned that truth is the foundation to everything, and because truth basically governs the essence, of it, and truth provides the essence of goodness and beauty. So without truth, you want to have goodness and beauty. So I, I kind of thought about things in life, because at first I didn't know what I was going to pick, but I had, to, I had to think about things really hard to choose, whether truth, goodness, and beauty. And I was like, okay, 
truth is the way that things are. Truth defines everything, and I live by truth, and I and I live by knowing certain truths, and that is it's most important to me than goodness for me. Okay, so tell me the truth. <laughs> how, how did you feel when I told you that you were enrolled at classical preparatory school? Because <laughs> the truth is good. It's, it's, it's the best thing, right? It's the only one. Yeah. To, to be honest, at first I wasn't too thrilled because I have never heard of classical education before and I wasn't really open to the idea of learning things like Plato and Aristotle and stuff like that and open to a super hard challenge. I wanted to kind of, I honestly want to go on FOBS and finish high school out easy. But now that I'm here, I realize that I've learned so much more than I ever could have anywhere else and I've really grown to love philosophy like uh, what Aristotle and Aquinas says and um, I, it's, if I wasn't here, I wouldn't be at the level of education that I ever think I could be. And so I would now, if you asked me two years ago, I wouldn't recommend classical education to anyone. Now I, re I would actively recommend a classical education to everyone in any who asks or who doesn't ask. Great. I got another question. <laughs> so you, you spent a lot of time on this uh, senior thesis. Um, is this just another project um, that you've done in high school? Or are you just going to tuck it away somewhere, um, forget about it, or can you continue to apply this to your life? No, I, I can absolutely apply this to my life, and I am actively applying it to my life. Now, I, I've learned that you know, truth is a powerful thing, and that you should be truthful throughout your whole life. Because if, if not, it just leaves a path, which is it's hard to turn around which is something I've really taken away from my studies in your philosophy. Okay, one last question. Sorry, your panel had two, I get three. <laughs> so, now that you've completed two years at Classical Preparatory School, and you said that on your first day you were not happy to be here, but it sounds like with the help of the people in this room, you've completed it, and you now have joy, because joy is an attitude, and happiness is a feeling. Would that be right? Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready? Is it ever okay to lie? Now, to preface that question, you said that, for example, absolute truth is what kind of binds us all together, the flow of truth, all that stuff. And you even referenced the Bible and, and Christianity and Jesus as the source of that ultimate truth. Yeah. But then why in the Bible did Rahab uh, lie and yet she's regarded as a hero of the faith? So do you see that the, yeah. the issue there? Is it ever okay to lie? Is there a time when the truth isn't the right answer? What's the, what do you think? So I would argue that um, it is okay to lie, but the choice to withhold the truth has to be justified on a moral end. So in the Bible, when uh, Rahab uh, decided to withhold the truth, it was because it was an effort to protect someone's life from an outside evil. So if, if you're withholding the truth in order to protect someone, not from themselves or from their own evil, but from an outside evil, then it is okay to withhold the truth, because that goes to the concept of graded absolutism, which is choice of the lesser of two evils. So choosing to lie was a lesser of the evil than choosing to tell the truth and having that person uh, be given off to evil. Nice. <laughs> okay, Max. I love your bridge analogy. So we're going to kind of give you back off of Mrs. Clayton's question about grades. So, I love this idea that we build a bridge between people and that um, and our truths are maybe what makes it strong. Here's my question. How do you build a strong bridge if you're building it with someone who doesn't share your truth? Okay. So, if, if someone doesn't particularly share your truth that you believe, 
you can still find other truths to build that relationship on. It might not be the strongest relationship or the most heaviest of relationship, but it will be, it'll still be a relationship with that person that is built still on truth. Great, so follow-up. Um, I, I kind of want to go back to this idea of grace, right? So in those types of relationships, you mentioned like, you want to build a bridge that allows for the heaviest truths to go over it without it collapsing. Do you believe that grace can build that type of strong, grace and love and respect, can build that kind of strong bridge so that when heavy truths do need to go over, that they can. Yes. So there is room for grace there is. rather than truth. Yes. Or choosing grace builds strong bridges also. Yes. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I mean, I first want to congratulate you, and I think we've all watched how you have invested in this process throughout the course of the year, and how you've taken it very seriously, and you know, conscientiously sought all of our collective advice and advice on an individual of how you can improve your paper. So it's been really enjoyable to see this process come to the culmination. Um, the question I have is kind of a two-part question. And of course, it deals with philosophy. So, um, you, in your thesis, you connect the idea of joy, which you say is the source of the good life, um, with a certain truth. And that truth is knowledge of the eternal, knowledge of the possibility of the eternal. Um, so, the first part of the question is, would you then say that the good life is accessible to people at any age? In other words, would you, would you say that it is equally accessible to an older person who has lived his or her whole life versus, you know, maybe a six-year-old child who accepts that they, there's a possibility of heaven. Yeah, I would, I would argue that once you are of the age, you have the ability to reason, you can you can have, live the divinely ordained good life. Uh, but contrary to that, the Aristotelian good life, which is the good life that Aristotle puts out, cannot be attained until later in life because when you're young, you're guided by passion, not by reason. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that kind of what you're talking about with the good life based on joy and uh, the divine, it can be achieved at any time during life. Yeah. Okay, um, so you're, you anticipated my question because you're talking about the Aristotelian versus the divine, and that's good. Um, so my question is, you know, Aristotle then talks about how there are well, he basically says there are two types of virtues. There are moral virtues, which we cultivate through habit, and those can be cultivated at any age. You know, a young child can cultivate moderation with the proper guidance and through the use of reason. Um, but then there are intellectual virtues, things like wisdom and prudence. And usually wisdom and prudence aren't virtues that we associate with the young, right? And I think you're, you're noting that, that they're usually associated with those who have lived a full life and who have exercised their reason for uh, you know, a long amount of time. So my question is, when you, Matt Black, are choosing between the Aristotelian model and the divine model, as you call it, when you're trying to figure out how to reconcile those, how would you make sense of the idea of, of wisdom and joy? You know, if, if wisdom is something that is only accessible to older people, but if anybody can have joy, then is there any particular purpose or value to draw to wisdom? Or, you know, do people already live the good life because they have joy apart from wisdom? Yeah. No, joy, uh, wisdom has a valuable role, and but as you say, Aristotle says, you can't attain wisdom until late in life whenever you master true goodness and beauty. So I think, so during life, you should be actively trying to master and perfect truth and goodness and beauty, which then will lead to the reward of wisdom. So. Okay, so in other words, wisdom is sort of the consequence of seeking all of these particular truths. Yeah. Um, okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Your mom took one of my questions. <laughs> 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 um, but to pick back off of what your mother was pointing out, we had several conversations with the two person over the years. We had several conversations. Um, but my question to you would be, what advice would you give to an incoming student or a current student that is preparing to go through this 
process on cultivating the right mindset for approaching this research project? Yeah, so I have found that a lot of people come into this project and this kind of process with a negative mindset because they kind of go through high school thinking, oh, it's senior thesis, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be terrible. But then whenever you get to it, if you have a negative mindset going, it just won't come out great, and it'll leave you behind on it, and eventually you'll have to just switch things around. Be like, I, I have to get this done because you're late. But I would, I would advise people to not have a negative mindset on it, but to have a positive mindset and see that I can learn something through this process, so why not just do it? And instead of having a maybe a negative look on it like everyone else in your class might, you can have a positive kind of look on it and just. Instead of just doing it just to do it, you can do it because you want to do it. So, good follow up Because you have a lot of fun doing this. So. <laughs> um, what would you say was the best part about this entire process for you? Probably being able to study something so deeply that I've never studied before or even have really studied much before. And so, I guess I can make this two part answer. Uh, the kind of, I guess the most I learned out of it was uh, whenever I was writing about the part about deception here, is that you know deception really kills, but it's very easy to partake in. So to live a life of, of truth, you have to actively try to live a life anti-deception, I guess I can call it, or trying not to trick people just for the sake of your own happiness. I'm going to piggyback off of something you said. <laughs> um, you mentioned the thing as far as uh, being negative, um, as far as the mindset that a lot of students have going into this. Now, I know the truth with this. Uh, when you knew you had to do this paper presentation, would you say you had a positive attitude or more of a negative attitude? I would, I would say I had negative attitude at first, but through talking with teachers before I started with this, they helped me learn that this is not just another assignment. It's something that I can learn from and take across my whole life. So that kind of gave me the attitude of, okay, this might actually be fun to do, and I can learn a lot from it. And you did. I do have one more question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you talk about how joy comes from knowledge of the truth of eternality, of the, the possibility of the divine of the eternal. Aristotle and Plato and Cicero believed in the eternal and in the divine. They lived before the time of Christ. Do you think that Aristotle and Plato and Cicero experienced the fullness of joy because they believed in the eternal, but that it was before Christ, or how do you approach that? I would say that they they did receive fullness of joy because I mean first of all they they really studied what they do and they they serve their their biggest thing of philosophy was searching for the truth and by searching for the truth they found even higher and higher and higher and higher portions of truth which eventually I think led them to the fullness of joy because every time they discovered another truth and answered more questions. The joy just kept build, building up until, boom, it hit the pipeline of joy. All right. All right, well, I think uh, that concludes Matthew's senior thesis. Let's all give another